today on public research. I still think the election will be very close, uh, but the big difference is that in 2016, you had uh, Hillary Clinton running against what was entirely a, a hypothetical. And the difference is we have now lived through the years of the Trump presidency. It's not hypothetical. You have things like uh, Harris putting the pictures of headlines saying Trump indicted and Trump convicted and Trump a criminal, and that is not something that existed in 2016. Does Kamala Harris have what it takes to take down Donald Trump? Nicholas Grossman of the University of Illinois joins me to discuss the state of the 2024 race after Biden's withdrawal and goes in depth on the expanding regional war between Israel and Iran. A quick note before we begin, this conversation was recorded on July 25th, just a few days after Biden dropped out of the race. While Kamala's rollout has gone more smoothly than I foresaw, as you'll see, the questions and issues raised here, I think, remain relevant still. So what a crazy set of events that have transpired this summer. Biden dropped out. Kamala, it's over. She's the nominee. There's not going to be a, a contest. But I think I, I, I sort of feel like I'm having deja vu. I feel like I'm in 2016 again. The overconfidence, you know, oh, Trump is so scared. You know, we, we got this. And so I looked up a Hillary campaign commercial. And I thought maybe we could start by looking at the new Kamala ad and the Hillary ad if, as sure. a way to sort of frame it, because it, they're um, similar. So we'll start with the Hillary ad. He says we should punish women who have abortion. There has to be some form of punishment. That Mexicans who come to America are rapists. They're rapists. And that we should ban Muslims from coming here at all. Total and complete shutdown. Donald Trump says we can solve America's problems by turning against each other. It's wrong. And it goes against everything New York and America stand for. With so much at stake, she's the one tough enough to stop Trump. Hillary Clinton. I'm Hillary Clinton, and I approve this message. This is the first uh, Kamala ad. In this election, we each face a question. What kind of country do we want to live in? There are some people who think we should be a country of chaos, of fear, of hate. But us, we choose something different. We choose freedom. Freedom! freedom not just to get by, but get ahead. The freedom to be safe from gun violence. The freedom to make decisions about your own body. We choose a future where no child lives in poverty, where we can all afford health care, where no one is above the law. We believe in the promise of America and we're ready to fight for it. Because when we fight, we win. So join us. Go to KamalaHarris.com. So um, I, I don't want to bloviate first. So why don't you just assess Kamala as a candidate? And is she the underdog in this race? So I think she has to be considered the underdog, at least for now, in that to the extent we have polling numbers, she was trailing before her candidacy was announced as a hypothetical matchup. The Democrats were trailing, you know, Biden was trailing Trump. Um, and there remains a uh, advantage that the Republican candidate has where um, they can win the White House without winning the most votes um, via the Electoral College. And so all those things are still in play. I still think the election will be very close. I still think just about anybody can win it. Uh, but the big difference, I think, with those two ads that you showed, the uh, biggest, well, one that just jumps out um, right off the bat is the the Harris one is soundtracked by Beyonce. And I don't know if that, you know, I, I at least found that, I don't say more stirring in that regard. But the, the biggest difference between the two um, is that we've had the eight years that happened in between. So in 2016, you had uh, Hillary Clinton running as uh, against what was entirely a, a hypothetical. 
that, you know, it was look at Trump as a candidate, but he had never held elective office. It was a lot easier for people to tell themselves things like, oh, you know, the Democrats are warning of that, but they're just being hysterical, you know, or like, oh, come on, they're just being politicians. It's not really going to happen. It's not really going to be like that. Or, you know, maybe, a, oh, well, they, they call tons of things racist, you know, so it's like a boy who cried wolf thing. And the difference is we have now lived through the years of the Trump presidency. It's not hypothetical. You have things like uh, Harris putting the pictures of headlines saying Trump indicted and Trump convicted and Trump a criminal. And that is not something that existed in 2016. And since the 2016 election was so incredibly close, I think the only real takeaway from it was that uh, if we ran the same, you know, it was extremely close. Anybody could have won. If we ran the same election, you know, in simulations a hundred times, uh, the and slight little tweaks of variables here or there, who knows what would have happened one way or the other. And so a even just starting at the baseline of how about rerunning the Hillary playbook, except not with Hillary as the candidate where people had spent, you know, however many decades building up dislike of her and her in the public eye. So just not with that and with the years of Trump to point to saying, do you really want to go back to that as opposed to do you really want to do this hypothetically? Let me tell you what I think it'll be like. Um, that is enough that I think it could make a difference. That doesn't mean I think she's going to win, you know, as a sure thing. But yeah, I think she's competitive. And I don't think that a sort of 2016, but with updated information strategy is a terrible idea. And I, I, I say this because I, I want her to win. The thing that struck me about her Kamala's ad was, where's the Rust Belt message? And I'm, I'm just sort of screaming at because to me, there, if you, if I had to pick a Democrat with the least ability to win the upper Midwest, it might be her. Like, I just can't. Trump every speech. I'm going to bring back those damn jobs from China. We're going to get them back. It might all be lies, of course, mm -hmm. but it's in every speech. And so let me ask you if uh, then yeah. why do you think it didn't work in 2020? You know, so so he did. Well, no, yeah, he won because those Midwest they picked, states in 2016. And, because they, um, cause the yeah. Democrats picked Biden. He could do a little bit of that protectionist, populist, Scranton Joe thing. What is going to be her message to the Rust Belt? But that's my concern. Yeah, so I, I think there we have to think of this in two ways. Uh, one is just, you know, what will be her message to the Rust Belt will be, I assume, the generic Democrat message in that uh, pro-union and look at us. We, you know, have you know, created jobs and rising wages and uh, the, you know, trying to point to various economic and we brought inflation under control and, you know, anything else along those lines. And uh, the other part of the question, though, of is not so much say what strategy are they going to run, but who are they trying to convince in what way? You know, what voters are we actually talking about? So when when you think about with these changes of what could decide elections, we have to start from the baseline that a good, I don't know, 90 some odd percent of voters are basically locked in already that you have. So take in, I don't know, you know, big swing, important swing state, something like uh, Michigan. You know, just as a pick an example, um, or maybe Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, I think, is probably the crucial state of the election that it was in 2020 and 2016, arguably in both. Trump won 2016, barely. Uh, Biden won a little by barely in uh, 2020. And it is likely, you know, it's the highest uh, electoral count swing state of um, this year. And so that's arguably uh, the most. And you have, you know, say maybe, a, I don't know, 40% already locked in for uh, Trump or really any Republican and 40% or so, and if it's estimating this, it might even be more locked in for the Democrat, whether it was Biden or Harris. So ultimately what we're talking about is how many voters are there in these states or in any others who were not already voting Trump, we're voting Biden and now won't vote or will switch to Trump because it's Harris. Or we're, say, undecided, we're open to Biden, but we're, uh, you know, maybe less inclined than to actually turn out to vote because it's Harris. And then versus whatever the inverse of that is. So um, in the same way, the uh, number of people are, uh, if there's, I don't know, picture a some older white guy who, you know, won't ever totally say this in public, but doesn't really like the idea of a, a woman being president, you know, for example. And how much is that balanced out by the 
a younger voter who was, you know, going to not bother to vote for either Trump or Biden, but will show up to vote for Harris. Or uh, Michigan specifically, there is a uh, large uh, Arab American, Muslim American population there that was pretty darn vocal about uh, being very negative towards uh, Biden because of the Gaza war and was even saying, making arguments along the lines of, uh, of look, I, I know Trump is really bad. You know, of course, I can honestly say, yes, I think that would be worse. But Biden is simply over my line. Like, I, I this is a moral issue for me. I cannot do it. And they are more open to voting for Harris as somebody different. And so the real answer is, I don't know. But I think you can make a at least plausible case that while there maybe are a few people that are turned off for her by her instead of Biden, there are also a few people who are excited by her and more inclined to vote for her than were for Biden. And I don't really know how those numbers shake out. But I do feel confident in that it is... Uh, at least within play, that those numbers could balance out or there could be slightly more in the tipping towards her than tipping away from her. I just I just looked up the median age in U.S. states. Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin are among the oldest states. Median age of Pennsylvania is nearly 41. 40 in Wisconsin, 40 in Michigan. But have you ever heard um, Kamala Harris give a speech on denouncing and outsourcing bad free trade deals? Uh, me personally, no. The, I, I've, I've never heard, heard, heard everything that you said, but I think that if, uh, you know, possibly at some point, uh, I don't know what her stance on, on trade is. And uh, I think maybe we could say it's the sort of thing that if neither you or, nor I have heard of it, that at the very least, it's not something that she's done in any sort of prominent way or is publicizing it as a stance. That, uh, it's a problem. And, and the irony is that her administration can brag about that. They passed the CHIPS Act. She needs to become, at least verbally, more of a protectionist populist fast. I, I would say, what do you think of that? You mean you think electorally? Um, I don't know on that one. It's that I hesitate on that because uh, I, I don't like that as a policy. Um, you know, or in other words, uh, I, I think that the arguments that um, globalization and automation, especially underrated part of this automation, um, have done a lot of damage to various communities and to uh, people who used to have those jobs and that therefore we as a country have a responsibility to help them uh, as a result and help, you know, people who through no fault of their own dealt with that. So I'm a pretty strong believer in that, uh, but not as a um, protectionism, especially. I'm just sort, talking about the politics. Showy. Right, right. So just, uh, just yeah, the yeah, politics. Yeah, yeah. That, that's me saying I don't. Um, so I don't totally know. I, I, I want. I'm hesitating to answer on the politics as it would be guesswork. I don't have numbers on it. And since I'm negative about the policy, then I'm more inclined to say something like, "Ah, it doesn't matter. It's bad policy anyway." But I don't necessarily think that's true. It, you know, probably matters to a bunch of people. Um, I don't know, except to say that we're probably talking about a relatively small number of people, small margins. And that something like, for example, uh, endorsements or support from union leaders would be something that could move more votes than, say, uh, a couple of sentences, especially uh, sentences that were maybe more protectionist and more about trade, especially considering that Trump will be hammering it. So this is, again, when I think back to the, you know, which voters are we talking about and how are they deciding is if you're somebody who really wanted a politician to say that. The, your problems are caused by outsourcing and caused by globalization, caused by, you know, these elites taking your jobs away and sending them elsewhere, and I'm going to fix it. And after four years of him clearly not fixing it when in office, you're still on board with that. That's what you want somebody doing. You want somebody just saying that sort of stuff. Well, then you've got a candidate. You've got Trump as your candidate. And so uh, how many are not already on board with him for that? but would get on board just because of this. And I think the number is relatively small. Now, granted, this will be a tight election. It will be decided by a relatively small number of votes, quite possibly in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, um, as tipping point states. Uh, although one that we didn't mention is Harris might open up other states that the Democrats under Biden had largely written off. So where the Biden campaign seemed to be treating uh, Georgia and Arizona, which he won in 2020, as likely losses. Nevada as a likely loss, even though we won in 2020. And North Carolina, which he was very close in, and which they tried to win in 2020, but lost to Trump, uh, also just kind of writing it off. And it's possible that the Harris campaign opens up that too. 
but the Democrats are in some pretty serious trouble if they don't do well in the uh, upper Midwest Rust Belt. I, I, I don't think it's actually about who works in, you know, a steel mill. I think the Trump rhetoric of oh, we're going, I'm going to bring back these jobs. It's a message of, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be the UN general secretary. I'm fighting for us. That's the signal it sends. And uh, I, I think you make a good point. But again, I think Biden was more of a populist protectionist type than Hillary. And he won. But do you think she's talented enough to pivot on these issues? Because I remember the one time she said, do not come on the border. She looks so uncomfortable. I, so I think the answer is probably no. And I, I don't mean that just as a uh, talent about her specifically, um, in that I think possibly nobody would be able to do that. Um, that overall, and this is back to the which voters are we talking about, you know, and trying to get in the mindset of uh, swing voters, undecided voters, uh, people who pay very little attention to politics and then end up checking in like a few weeks before and doing something like, Hey, you know, I bet I'd like to hang out with that one more than the other one, you know, or something along those lines. And just all of this to put in the mindset, it's quite hard for people who, uh, like me, I think, you know, like you, who follow politics pretty closely. And so we're thinking about a lot of the issues. So with uh, something like the border, uh, if that is a big concern for you, and especially the sort where um, the concern is just the border, meaning there isn't really a, it's not like a, uh, say, policy position paper or something on it, or a like thought out plan of what to fix. It's basically a, uh, I'm concerned about the border. Because I mean, in a policy thing, I'm saying I'm a, I'm a national security person. I mean, the the argument for uh, the, the country should have a good sense of who is coming and going across its uh, international borders and should uh, be able to quickly process paperwork or what have you for anybody that comes in it strikes me as a very strong art. I don't even think there's much of a counter argument to that. It's more a question of how and how much resources and what are we willing to let go you know, or, or other things like that. But if you're somebody who is voting on the border, you're probably voting Republican or voting Trump. This has been their number one or number two issue for a long time. Um, one of the biggest ways that Trump changed the Republican Party was the business conservatives that used to run it were largely pro-immigration, and I'd say including, even though they didn't totally say it, pro-illegal immigration, because a lot of that is very cheap labor uh, for them, and so they were largely cool with it. And then Trump changed the Republican Party by tapping into the uh, people who are, say, not so much for maybe national security reasons, but especially for cultural reasons. It was very negative about a lot of the border stuff and immigration, and those are all solid Trump voters. I don't think that the immigration czar is really going to be much of a liability for Harris only because the issue was already a big liability for Biden, already a big liability for Democrats in general. And uh, there is no ability for them to say that, you know, we are as anti-immigrant as you are or, you know, as hawkish on immigration as you are uh, or as willing to uh not just, I would say, not just denigrate, but lie about migrants and, you know, lie about, say, the percentage of criminals or, or violence or something it comes from and heavily exaggerate that, that if you're somebody who likes that, you're voting Trump. And so uh, the it is an issue. It is it, it is a issue. It's um, probably one of the biggest issues why the election is going to be close, even if Harris ends up being personally a lot more popular than Biden and able to consolidate a lot of that vote. There still are millions upon millions of Americans who disagree with Democrats on a lot of core policy issues and uh, core cultural issues and approach to the world. And the border and immigration is a big one. So that's going to be a fight that was there regardless. Immigration hawks are going to be voting Republican regardless. And I don't really think there's that much for Harris to do about it. There is maybe the little bit of where uh, electoral margins could come into play where if they can emphasize it more. So, you know, maybe... Uh, the Democrats will try to sell people on the statistic, which is true, which, you know, came out recently of that um, illicit border crossings are down. So they're they're down under Biden. And she can say, you know, look, you know, we had this success and conservative media and their Trump campaign and others will totally reject this and say, you know, it's uh, just flat out lie about it and say it's it's the most ever, you know, or whatever it is. And anybody who buys that is is voting Trump. And there's no I don't think there's any way a Democrat can win them over. So what are your concerns about Kamala, if you have any? Uh, so I, 
That's a good question because I, I realize I am being uh, pretty darn positive. I think a lot of it is because the uh, I think she simply has a better chance than Biden does with the. Oh, of course, we agree on the guy could not to be rude, but he was having trouble speaking. Yeah, I totally. Yeah, he, he he couldn't do it. I, I think that the um and, and in the end the. Uh, uh, he admitted kind of that he couldn't do it. I mean, he needed to get, you know, some pressure of it, just like, uh, you know, if anybody who has had to ask like, you know, dad or grandpa or something of like, look, it's really time to, to give up the keys, you know, to give up the car keys. Uh, that's usually not easy. And a lot of times it's sort of drawn out. And um, I remember it was a you know, fight in my family and something and where uh, grandpa did local driving, but not distance driving anymore for a while it was sort of the compromise and, you know, and everybody felt better. And then eventually he said, okay, you know, it really is probably time. But anyway, the, um, yeah, so the, the age issue and associated worries about his ability to do the job for four more years were a decently bigger liability. Uh, I think one that you have uh, touched on well, which is that um, Harris is in position to maybe run up the score more in solid blue states while perhaps losing some margins in the uh, purplest states and, you know, sort of the, the swing states. So I think that part is still in play. Um, I don't really know. I think some a lot of people are overestimating things like racism and sexism. Again, sort of a similar argument of if you care about that, if that's something that you really think about when you're voting, aren't you already voting Trump? Um, and still, though, there are probably some, you know, how many are, uh, I don't know the answer to this. I mean, I, I have a more optimistic opinion about it with things like, is America ready for a woman president? Um, I think you can actually point to the Hillary Clinton campaign as an example that the answer is yes, as opposed to no. So meaning uh, everything breaking perfectly for her opponent, coming after eight years of Democrats holding the White House with 20 something years of personal Hillary baggage and all the attacks that were against her. She still got more votes than uh, anybody else and came extremely close in the Electoral College. And so that shows that it's, I don't know, doable as opposed to can't be done. But then again, maybe there are people who have uh, you know, even if they don't admit it, they'll when they vote, they'll go and say, you know, I really don't think a woman is up to handling, I don't know, Putin, you know, or whatever, um, or uh, who have some sort of animosity against black women that, you know, they put in specifically with the vote. And I don't know what the answer to that is. So given that America has never had a woman president, uh, never had a black woman president, that those, uh, you know, has its legacy of bigotry in various ways and, you know, prejudice in various ways, that that is in theory, a liability, uh, though it could also be an asset, um, various, you know, liberal things. I mean, I think actually the, the best part about Harris's candidacy, I think, is that when people look back to 2020, the big liability that she had running for the Democratic nomination um, was that she was a uh, police officer. She was not a police officer. Sorry, she was a prosecutor. Um, and there's a line against her that uh, the left wing of the party that was uh, really into the idea of defund the police at the time was, you know, Kamala's a cop. And... Uh, we are, you know, we, the party at the time was pretty anti-cop and that has in essence flipped that she's clearly steering into it. Um, and the, it fits better in terms of going against Trump, you know, going against a criminal, uh, fits better. And also it allows her to be maybe more herself. So I think kind of one of the biggest, let me just by analogy, uh, uh, one of the biggest political mistakes I've ever seen was when Al Gore's campaign team in 2000 convinced him that talking about like the environment and climate change and stuff was boring and stiff and people didn't like it, so don't do it. And that was the thing that Gore himself was the most passionate on. And so he avoided talking about it. He kept on talking about these topics that they told him were the topics people care about. And then the line on Gore became, he's really stiff, he's not authentic, he's not passionate, he doesn't care. Um, and in the same way, I think a lot of the impressions of uh, you know, Harris, she's kind of phony. She doesn't really have it as a campaigner that came out in 2020 is because her political persona is I'm a tough on crime prosecutor and, uh, you know, also support some of these other reforms. So that was her big thing. Like I put crooks in jail and she's steering into that more, which I think is beneficial. But I know this is the opposite. If you ask me, what do I think are the detriments? And I'm finding it hard to, to pick it out because uh, on balance, the answer is stronger than Biden, which means well, a better chance against Trump. And so we, you know. we, we, we agree on the Biden thing. So we don't mm -hmm. even need to make that case. I think that's obviously true. Um, my fear, and we actually, we talked about this, is that we're going to, and, and, I wonder if you saw her first speech in Wisconsin. Did you see? Any I saw of clips that? of it. I didn't yeah. see it. 
And there was something that worried me about it, which is, uh, her, I, it might have been her campaign address, but she went in on the sexual assault case that Trump lost. And it, I just had these echoes of that first Hillary Trump debate and my memories of Trump just saying, we're going to get those jobs back from China. Uh, you sold us out. I'm getting those jobs back. And then would go to Hillary and she'd be like, you called this woman Miss Piggy in 1997. And I want you to know she's going to be voting. You're a bad sexist. And uh, and I think about Rust Belt voters being like, well, I'll I'll vote for the bad guy if he'll, you know, if he's fighting for me. Yeah, and I, I worry I, I worry about they need to not do what Hillary did. Mm hmm. I think that makes sense as a realistic concern. Uh, it just seems more more 2016 than 2024. Um, in that the if a, if the Harris campaign was not thinking about that at all, they're making a mistake. So you know, I think at a base level of uh, who they have to appeal to, what do they have to avoid saying? Um, but just taking the the contrast of that, you know, with 2016, of uh, one, you had the Trump as a candidate then was talking a lot more about policy that. Uh, you know, a lot more about getting your jobs back. And he spends much more of that time now talking about uh, how personally aggrieved he is and, you know, how, how much he's going to get revenge and, and how unfair to you it is that people are uh, holding him accountable for his, his crimes, you know, trying to, to sell that as opposed to doing a lot of the here so I can help you. Um, the things that Hillary was pointing to was you can see almost like a like better term, maybe a, a cancel culture aspect to them of the way you said like, hey, you said this about this person many years ago, and I'm going to make a big deal about that. Uh, that's different from saying a jury convicted you of multiple felonies this year. You know, or a uh, a court found you uh, legally liable, a court found you liable, you know, you have to pay millions of dollars uh, because you raped a woman. That. Those are both more powerful. It's not a you said, it's a you did. Uh, it's not a let's look back at this old thing. It's uh, let's look at current news. Um, it's not you said, it is a jury and a court of law uh, said, multiple uh, courts of law said, and people have lived through the policy experience. So um, the, and, and just uh, one also I think not to underestimate um, is there are a lot of voters and I'm thinking primarily but not exclusively women here, uh, who are activated by that. So I'm thinking of like, you know, the type of voter that is especially the like, oh, I don't care if he's a rapist, just get me my job. I mean, I'm sure that there are some voters like that, but there are also a bunch of voters who care quite a bit about the fact that uh, he's, you know, been found guilty of sexual assault and kind of brags about it. And granted, when we talk about who's already locked in, Probably the vast majority of them are already solidly Democrats who are going to turn out to vote for Biden or for Harris or for whoever the Democrat was, vote for literally anybody against Trump. So that's also probably not winning over many different voters or many marginal voters. Uh, but then we're getting into very narrow kind of points of emphasis about the campaign. And so uh, things like where do they air ads of, I think, a relatively safe prediction, haven't seen this yet, but a relatively safe prediction. There will be a lot of stuff talking about uh, blue collar work, factory work, um, but she other has types to of say stuff it. on ads in the Midwest. But she has to say it. I, I mm. mean, I she, I've never heard her do it. But she needs to say to give. I'm going to be fighting for you. You know, you who live in a steel town in Michigan. Mm -hmm. I just am a, so allergic to this vague cliche unity past on it's really what she's known for the coconut thing you know the, these this word salad on you know the future on un, unburdened by what is it's like i don't want to don't do don't do that none of the word salad stuff my theory of politics is it's sort of dumb. You need to think about it of what are you going to give me? I'm a voter. What am I going to get if I vote for you? You know, Hillary 2016, what what was she going to give us? I don't know. But Trump had build the wall is very clear, very visually. And my prediction is Trump will be running as pro-choice at the end of his campaign because he has to win or, or he might go to jail. He's going to promise, and he already does, everything. And so what is Kamala going to promise? And, and one thing in her ad that I noted is she said every American should be able to afford health care. 
And this is one of the things that drives me crazy is this afford thing and affordable access to and rather than just making it simple. We're the richest country on earth. Italy has universal health care. You know, you break your leg in Italy, you're poor, you go to the doctor, you don't have to pay for that. They don't have one big tech company and they get that, but we don't. Um, what is Kamala? That's one thing I worry is that she's going to run on all these cliches and, and it needs to be, what are you going to give us? Well, I, I have a both sort of um, partial agreement and partial disagreement with that, which is that uh, it's always a mix in, in terms of, of politics stuff that one, um, one lesson, uh, one of the most important lessons, I think, of the uh, Trump election, kind of the whole Trump phenomenon, um, is that a big chunk of politics is not material. You know, so the extent to which we've seen the uh, the numerical base and sort of a lot of the energy uh, of uh, Trump support is not among what in at least any traditional measure would be working class. So uh, if you do the working class as a whole, Biden won them um, in terms of votes in 2020. Even Hillary uh, did better with uh, people earning less than $100,000. Trump won the ones over uh, earning $100,000, uh, just, you know, as one example of it. Um, and just the or take, uh, I don't know, a great example of this is who went to January 6th? You think of who who has the time to take off in the middle of the work week and go to D.C., some of them flying private, uh, to, you know, then go and get involved with politics and a whole lot of people just at a very simple level. They're like, I can't take off work. You know, the, I just, I can't, I, and on top of that, I can't, uh, tr uh, can't afford to travel, you know, to, to DC in the middle of the week, I got to work. Um, and so a lot of that, um, energy for it, there's that, you know, other, uh, cultural or, you know, say other, meaning not explicitly a, uh, what did you get me materially? And yet, uh, a lot of that is involved with politics too. So it's sort of a mix. And so when, when you were talking about, the uh, what did you get me? The um, person I thought of in terms of running for president, um, the most in contrast, probably the high watermark of this is Obama. And you think of um, what did Obama really promise people that sort of like to the extent it was, what is this going to do for me? Or what are you giving me? I think probably the best answer was hope for the future. Um, the idea, you know, it was a depths of the economic crisis. There might have specific things about that getting better for people paying attention to policy. You know, I'm a big foreign policy person. Obama said that he was going to, uh, that invading Iraq was a mistake and he was going to focus more on Afghanistan. Um, you know, so there were obviously a lot of different policy things. There was health care. You know, what am I going to give you? Uh, health insurance. You know, so, uh, that was a big one. Um, but I think a lot of the, the sale of it, is, of uh, presidents and politics, is that combination of both uh, I think this is going to benefit me in some sort of materially concrete way. And also a, like, I feel, I don't know, inspired. And I, I feel that, I feel that tickle in my America Patriot spot. And, you know, the, the sort of thing that, uh, I'll say, I just want a, a direct base on something recent was I had a strong reaction to the, uh, speech that Biden gave would amount to his, I guess, more or less farewell, uh, here's officially why I'm dropping out a uh, speech that he gave last night. And it was because he appealed to a lot of these kind of grand American ideals. And that when I think of people like, uh, you know, was, I don't know, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King. And you think of all these, like, you know, the, the great Americans and their great uplifting speeches and the way the music swells at that moment in the movie when they're being triumphant. And uh, that stuff feels great. And it's one of the things that has sold America and American democracy and the image of the uh, American flag as a symbol of freedom and stuff all around the world. So um, if anything, I think since we're talking about presidential candidates, the bar is high, maybe that we have gotten used to ones that didn't clear it, but that uh, the bar is pretty high for them and it involves of making it both. Here's how I'm going to help you in very specific, concrete ways that your life will be better if you elect me. And also come and join me in uh, this sweep of history as we carry on the great traditions and bring them forward that were handed to us and, you know, end up like those uh, I don't know, our, our forefathers who did whatever. Think of the way we venerate the founders or we venerate the World War II generation and, you know, all the, to be a part of something like that. And so they have to do both. And I don't know if she can pull it off, uh, but the loftiness is uh, not the thing that necessarily appeals to everybody, but gets quite a few people to get more involved and to really want to be a part of it. And that's where you can see that 
Uh, Obama did that in 2008. And with a different constituency, Trump did something like that in 2016. The Trump 2016 campaign was a lot more hopeful, a lot more sort of forward looking. This is exciting. Won't this be great? As opposed to where it is now, which is quite dark. Yeah, that, where it is now is uh, I, I only looked at uh, VP candidates that pledged that they would have helped me stay in power after I lost the election, uh, as Vance did. Mm -hmm. So something interesting happened yesterday. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu gave a speech before Congress, and there were anti-Israel protesters outside. And I, they burnt an American flag. There was graffiti on a Columbus statue that said Hamas is coming. Uh, uh, I wonder if you're Trump's campaign manager, Chris Lasavita, is he thinking right now, boy, when uh, colleges start up in September, I really hope those... Uh, encampments come back. So I think that you're you're right in that the Trump campaign is likely hoping for it. In that the uh, Republican strategy is for a long time, but something that the the Trump campaign has really steered into over the last eight years uh, is primarily to run against the left. You know, so whereas Democrats tend to run against specific Republican leaders, stop Trump, or I don't know, I hate Bush, or whatever. Uh, that Republicans tend to run against this kind of amorphous left. And, you know, we got to run to stop the left or uh, Biden is captured by the left or whatever version of that. That's this kind of amorphous radicalism. And so they often aim to highlight of whoever is the most outspokenly radical and especially in off-putting ways leftist in the country, try to make them nationally famous and to say that this is what the whole Democratic Party is. So, you know, if you're bothered by this, uh, then you'd be bothered by the entire party. And uh, one of the reasons that I think Biden won was uh, in 2020 was because a whole lot of people looked at Joe Biden and were like, really? that guy you're telling me that guy you know who i've seen for decades the old catholic white guy uh he's the radical leftist he's, Come the, on. he's a marxist don't you know that yeah. right right right. and so that was ridiculous and that's going to be easier for them to try to pin on harris uh with um her race and gender being part of it but also in you know the language she's uh younger and the language that she talks uh sounds more like you know in many ways say uh young democrats are left-wing activists at times um so that will be potentially a uh, bigger liability for her. But um, the that is something that any Democratic campaign was going to have to navigate. Um, and I think that Harris in particular is in a decently better position uh, on uh, for U.S. electoral politics, decently better position to deal with the Gaza war, uh, because a lot of the left wing anger uh, against uh, uh, against both Israel specifically, but against Biden for uh, his policy towards it, um, they had focused it specifically on Biden himself. And so a lot of them, while I think that if Harris gets elected, uh, that a lot of them will be disappointed in the sense that the U.S.'s re relationship is much deeper than a uh, given politician or two or some rhetoric or two. You know, you think with uh, decades of uh, military and intelligence and economic ties and culture and just all these different business ties, all these ways up and down. Um, that they're not going to find the U.S. suddenly, say, you know, treating Israel like a pariah, like they would want. Um, but at the same time, the uh, Israel has declined in popularity in the United States. That the opposition to Israel's conduct, or let's say, let's uh, maybe even if not opposition, at least uh, serious criticism of Israel's conduct in the Gaza war, not of fighting back against Hamas, but of how they've done it and the amount of force that they've used, then uh, the lack of planning for anything else or the seeming uh, low level of concern for civilians, that this has turned off a whole lot of Americans. It is not just a uh, left-wing, um, anti-Zionist, sometimes has elements of anti-Semitism, you know, radical sort of uh, campus thing anymore. It's a much bigger, wider story. So I can see where a, uh, I think the Republicans would like if, campus protests get going again you know, and get major national attention again in the way that they did towards the end of the spring semester. But I also don't really think that's going to happen. And for a couple of reasons of uh, one is I think there is some sense of uh, giving Harris a partial pass on it and that um, that meaning 
a lot of the protesters' anger is against Biden specifically, or to the extent, say, it's in the U.S. Um, the war itself has somewhat uh, at least reduced in intensity, and uh, there is a possibility that the Biden administration does get something, some sort of agreement or some sort of ceasefire that they've been pushing for for so long. Um, and uh, just at a media level, the uh, Gaza war is no longer the biggest story in America. It was for a period of time. Uh, part of that is, you know, the events itself and how many, much Americans care about it. Part of it, though, a lot is media and just media choosing what to emphasize or, um, you know, what issue is at a given moment that getting a lot of clicks or anything like that. And the Biden, reti Biden retirement, uh, Harris uh, ascension, and now the Trump-Biden campaign and presidential race is going to be the front page news basically here on out uh, to the end. You know, I mean, maybe a couple of other things, but it's going to be the major focus. And I really don't see a multi-week, everybody talk about these protests on campus thing happening again that could potentially be exploited by a Trump campaign. Do you think the uh, encampment at Columbia will be uh, resurrected in the fall? Uh, that's that's a really good question. I mean, I don't know. So I um, so if there hasn't been a ceasefire deal, yeah. I mean, so a lot of it also is depends on what you mean by ceasefire. I think most of the people at the protest. So if we take the assumption, let's just say between you know within the next couple months uh, that there is some sort of ceasefire agreement, most of the people at those protests were not going to be satisfied by it because uh, their version of it was. Israel unilaterally quits, not the U.S. brokers an agreement between Israel and Hamas that stops the fighting, at least temporarily, which is what a lot of people mean by ceasefire. So I don't think that, that would necessarily uh, stop the protesters. But do you think that they'll have less energy and that the university administration will be caught less flat footed? Um, and yeah, I would not be. I mean, I went in thinking I went into the summer thinking that we would see campus protests pop up again uh, in the. Um, in the fall. And actually before that, we will probably see a number of uh, pro-Palestine, anti-Israel protesters at the DNC, uh, at the Democrats convention. And they're going to have to deal with that too. Although it is harder uh, to make the case of, you see all those people saying how much they hate the Democrats and are protesting against the Democrats. They're who you're voting for if you vote for Democrats. You know, that is a harder sell. Um, but the cell is more a look at this kind of chaos and, you know, look at this stuff. Isn't that bad? Don't you dislike that? And yeah, I could see some protests, protests starting up again. And I could certainly see things like right wing influencers trying to, uh, again, pinpoint whoever is the craziest seeming person at the anywhere, the protest in the country and make them nationally famous. I think we could see that again. Sure. Um, so but I'd be surprised if they are as large and as uh as much grabbing pub, grabbing as much public attention. Yeah, I mean, you're definitely right about people were complaining this election is boring. And so Gaza was blocking it out for a long time. Mm -hmm. But now it really has moved away from the front page of U.S. consciousness. Gabby Deutsch from Jewish Insider uh, reached out to the Kamala campaign in the White House about the flag burning and the, the Hamas flags. And she reported that the Biden spokesperson responded condemning it and the Kamala people wouldn't give a response. She said she couldn't preside over Netanyahu's speech because she had a, uh, another commitment. It was a sorority conference, I guess, in Indiana. So and, and I can't blame her like this would probably be what I would advise if I was a campaign manager, which is just avoid the issue. I wonder, isn't she going to be forced to, or do you think she can do that for the, this whole campaign? I'm going to give the same sort of yes and no answer. Yeah. You know, that uh, I am. Um, so I think subsequently, just before we went on here, um, I think her team did put out some statement or that she put out some statement that oh, really? uh, amounts okay. to, um, that I'll have to look it up, but it, it amounts to without, without going after, say, the cause itself, you know, saying stuff like, uh, Vandalism is wrong. Support for terrorist groups is bad. Uh, you know, hitting police is wrong. That I think um, she in particular, I think, is on a, a solid ground. This is, again, tapping into the prosecutor thing. Um, also, given the fact that the 
uh, images that are part of what's burned into people's minds of uh, who is beating up cops. It's the January 6th attackers. It's not, you know, say necessarily just a uh, left wing protester thing. Um, but yeah, she'll have to navigate it that I have the same reaction to you as I'm um, thinking, OK, they're just trying to just hope this doesn't this isn't an issue. Just try to make it go away, largely ignore it. Um, I don't think that's entirely off base in that there really is no answer for it, that this is, um, you know, Israel-Palestine and especially uh, the conflict Israel-Hamas and Israel-Hezbollah also conflicts are one of the things I've been teaching about for years. And uh, the it's a problem without a solution. That This is sort of why whenever, whenever people always talk about uh, some solution or another uh, for the broader, you know, Israeli-Palestinian question, they always talk about it as, let me envision some future scenario that I think would be fair. That's my solution. And they never have any idea how to get from A to B. Uh, and because because I just think it's impossible. Anyway, so the reason why I say with electorally in the United States, any sort of like, I'm going to solve this problem is a loser and is going to right. bother people in one way or another. Because uh, as much as, um, e even this way, when I brought up with the protesters specifically, I think a lot of them were really underestimating how much the Biden administration was trying to get some sort of ceasefire deal and how many uh, different things that they were balancing at the time. So we're, what? oh, sure, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, since you are an expert on foreign policy, let me just uh, pivot to policy for a second. You know, I think Biden's been a good president. I, I, of course, I'm glad he'd be Trump. Um, the one area I, I think he really has been bad was Iran sanctions, where he just took the foot off the gas. I, I, I'm not sure if the figures are right, but I've seen $80 billion, $120 billion of revenue that uh, Iran got because the uh, oil sanctions weren't they weren't vigorously enforced by uh biden uh do you think that was a mistake uh sort of but maybe for a different reason say than than many others which is that uh that to the extent that they uh, eased up on enforcement, that it was part of negotiations to try to get a uh, iran back into some sort of nuclear agreement and uh, that, as a general goal, I think is extremely important, also really underrated, that this is the, uh, you know, nukes are a game changer in the way just about nothing else is. And uh, so I liked the original deal quite a bit. I think all the mistakes, basically, uh, all the criticism uh, amounts to either, uh, well, you know, at some point, some of these things expire. And so I was wondering, okay, so then why do we want to let them do it now, as opposed to maybe in 15 years, if we can't, you know, work something out. Uh, or that some sort of fantasy about, you know, they were just about to give in totally. And, you know, that's not remotely true. And so more or less complaining of, oh, you have to give up something to get something, which of course, sort of how deals go. Uh, and then when Trump let Iran out of nuclear restrictions in exchange for nothing, I thought that was a really bad mistake. And I have, I think, been really vindicated on that. Not that this was hard to see coming. A lot of people saw it coming. But the result of that has been Iran decently closer to a nuclear weapon with a bunch more enriched uranium and Iran more influential in Iraq and more Iran and its proxies more influential and on the march in Syria and Iran more influential in Lebanon um, and uh, just overall, uh, and, uh, Iran's proxies and uh, in Yemen more influential than they were. And so overall, just Iran has been stronger in the Middle East since this, not weaker. Um, so I think that the approach of trying to maybe get negotiations uh, was not a bad desire, but I was very skeptical that they would ever possibly work in that uh, the from the Iranian perspective, this was not a well, you know, Donald Trump is kind of a crazy, and so he just did this once, but otherwise, you know, no big deal, we'll make a, you know, an agreement with America. From the Iranian perspective, it was, we had a deal with the United States, we honored it, they broke it. Why would we ever trust them again? And for that matter, there was a really big argument within Iran in which uh, they only decided to do it in the first place. It was a big fight, and it was kind of barely came out as the winner. And so then everybody who said, you can't trust the Americans. They're just trying to manipulate us or having a giant I told you so moment. So I thought that that was never going to work. But that said, I do think that Biden has handled Iran quite well in that has had a uh, limited application of force, but with preventing things from spiraling and 
but by keeping up diplomacy. So, uh, for example, I thought the best way that uh, Biden had handled Iran was when there was a number of, uh, there was a lot of rocket fire from uh, Iranian proxy militias in various parts of the Middle East. And this is something that has been happening on and off for many years. There's another thing that uh, Trump claimed that he ended and it started up immediately after, meaning while he was still in office, that restarted almost immediately um, after it killed Iranian General Soleimani in uh, January 2020. Um, so the way that uh, Biden first sort of ordered the U.S. military to basically shrug it off when it wasn't doing anything, you know, shoot, shoot down the things that come in. But uh, if there's no real damage, we're just going to look the other way on it, try to not have things spiral. And then when one ended up killing three U.S. service members, uh, ordered strikes on a number of Iranian-backed militias uh, while communicating directly to Iran that uh, this would, um, he was going to avoid striking any Iranian target, but this time, but was holding them responsible and that uh, this was going to be a blow against the militias only and that they could move some of their stuff in ways that it wouldn't hurt Iran directly. And that then uh, the next U.S. attack would be larger if Iran didn't pull them in. And it both then, so the U.S. strike destroyed a number of those uh, militia assets, you know, uh, warehouses of weapons, that sort of thing. Um, and then Iran uh, told them to uh, basically cool it to kind of pull back. And that has largely worked in that rocket fire against U.S. soldiers in uh, U.S. troops in um, Iraq in particular and around this other one was across the border in Jordan has declined since then. Uh, or another example of it, of this would be um, helping to orchestrate the group air defense when Iran did a, a big launch against Israel. Um, and so overall, I think he has handled that quite deftly. Uh, if anything, because I think so, um, I think decently more in regional security than in, say, local issues. Uh, if anything, I think the larger regional competition with Iran is the part that of that's very relevant to the Gaza war that gets talked about less. So, you know, as uh, I think a lot of people, especially when we talk about the protesters, focus on the war that it's very much just uh, the fighting in Gaza itself out of context, you know, just period. Of uh, and you know, and there's something I don't want to totally dismiss that because there's something to the just basic human argument of a lot of people are getting killed, a lot of them are innocent, a lot of those innocents are kids. I want that to stop. You know, there, there's a very straightforward logic, a uh, very human logic to that, uh, to that interest. And uh, then when they go further and say stuff like, so the U.S. should uh, cut off all arms to Israel. So, you know, the part they're missing is uh, the primary effect of that would be to make Israel more vulnerable to Iran, which would make Iran more tempted to do some sort of attack, which raises the risk of regional war and therefore is a bad idea. Um, but that is not specifically, say, about any conduct that Israel is doing now. And so that is something where I certainly wouldn't say that the Biden administration's approach is perfect. Uh, but I think that the degree to which they've tried to balance many difficult competing interests has been pretty deft and that the uh, most important thing is the dog that didn't bark, which is regional war with Iran. I, you know, I wonder about Iran. I think you're right on the JCPOA. That was a big mistake. Um, I wonder if Trump had stayed in, if that deal was still active, how different would you guess Iran's behavior since October 7th might have been? Do you think when Trump got out of the deal, the, the, the leadership in Iran just said after October 7th, well, there's no reason to be restrained, you know? Or, or do you think their behavior would be meaningfully different? Uh, that's a good question. And um, so this is just assuming all the Trump policies in place, then Trump wins re-election, and then October 7th happens when it happens. Uh, the I, I'm saying if Trump hadn't gotten out of the deal. And, right. Oh, if yeah, you have a... Yeah, yeah. So, it, um, it, if, if Biden if, uh, had been elected, but the going. deal was still in effect. Yeah. Uh, no, then, okay, so then I do think it would be significantly different in that the uh, the hope of JCPOA, and this is not something that I think, it, you know, nobody actually knew that this was going to happen, but the hope, and this is the reason why things like those sunset provisions were not really that big of a deal, is uh, the idea of it was get the next generation of Iranians hooked on the global economy. And, you know, make it where they're getting, uh, they're more internet savvy, they are, you know, more connected in all sorts of ways. And then when 15, 20 years roll by and some hardliners are like, hey, shouldn't we give all this up to, you know, try to do some sort of push for weapons, that there would be a much stronger, for example, business community 
uh, that would have more power within Iran and would react very negatively to it would be able to keep a clamp on it. That was kind of the, the long-term hope for it. Um, and if that was still in play, then uh, from the Iranian perspective, even say more of the hardliners, then uh, getting more aggressive in some manner would break what was a uh, ongoing detente with the United States. So Iran from the Islamic Revolution in 1979 has a big problem with the US. The US had uh, been the primary sponsor of the dictator that they overthrew. Uh, the CIA and British intelligence had helped installed him in a coup against an Iranian prime minister. So Iran was quite bitter about this. Uh, then there was the long Iran-Iraq war, and the U.S. was mostly in a, like, let them fight sense, but they did help Iraq a little more and kind of make sure that Iraq killed more Iranians. Um, and then you have all the, you know, so there was the hostage crisis with uh, the U.S. embassy in uh, the 79 with the revolutions. You have hostile relations between the two the whole time. Um, and uh, Iran has been very calculated. So uh, for all their religious rhetoric and things and leaders are maybe talking apocalyptic, apocalyptic terms, the state uh, behavior has, they've been doing statecraft that um, it has been from a, uh, you know, Iranian uh, strategic perspective. Um, but it has all been kind of calm, rational, that they have, um, when they do things like, for example, the uh, proxy militias, they kind of dial them up or dial them down and have uh then they don't totally control them which is you know part of the issue but uh they the way that they tend to do it is step a bit over the line or push the line a little and then be able to pull back and they have uh never really and i do mean this never done something where they just hurl over the hurdle over the line with you know no looking back um to give examples of that i'd say that uh Russia invading Ukraine was an example of hurtling over the line. Uh, Hamas attacking Israel that uh, that big of an attack on October 7th was just hurtling over the line. And, you know, the let's just see what happens next, but we can't possibly control it. And, you know, it could go really bad. Iran hasn't done something like that. So if they had this uh, at that point, 10 years, well, no, sorry, 2015 was when it was signed. So it would have been uh, seven years of this deal working. Then they would have felt you know, maybe more of a clamp on it. But the other way. Uh, that Trump did uh, contributed to this was by uh, facilitating, kind of strongly supporting the uh, Netanyahu strategy of kind of squeeze, ignore, and go around the Palestinians. Um, so uh, with um, Trump worked to get deals with between Israel and uh, was Bahrain and the UAE, um, and by doing it with what amounted to uh, bribes with advanced fighter jets and drones that uh, was on the table before, and you know just previous U.S. presidents didn't think it was a good idea, uh, but did that and facilitated. And look, I, diplomacy, peace treaties, I think are generally positive, um, but usually the terms of those agreements were, okay, we can do this peace if you do something better with the Palestinians. And so this was, ah, eh, forget them, just go around them. And uh, they had the Palestinians divided between uh, Hamas controlling Gaza and the PA and Fatah controlling the West Bank. And they seemed to work to keep it that way. And uh, Trump cut off funds to the Palestinian Authority, including things that went to a, a East Jerusalem hospital. So this was before any of the war. It was just because uh, basically the Palestinians are the way they gave the speech was we're not going to reward terrorism, uh, which it's not like the East Jerusalem hospital was, you know, doing terrorism. Um, and uh, by taking this kind of, we can ignore the Palestinians, squeeze and go around, that Trump's policy, yeah. definitely not exclusively, uh, I would not say it is his fault primarily, uh, but his Middle East policy contributed to the October 7th attack on the Gaza war, and that without it, we might not be in this position. They wanted to get back in the global consciousness, which they succeeded at doing. Yeah, um, it worked. At, at very bloody cost. Um, but, but on this Iran thing, uh, somebody told me, and I looked it up, it's true, that there's a square in Tehran where they have a giant clock, and all it does is count down the minutes and seconds till, till the, the destruction of Israel, which is going to, they say, 2040. It, 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 it seems like destroying the Zionist entity is sort of a core part of almost a state religion with the Iranian regime. So I wonder, is that ever going to change with the Islamic regime, this version of the government in Iran? Or do you think they'll never give up that aggressive 
posture? Probably not, you know, without, say, a significant change in the government and governing system. Uh, part of the reason why is a lot of a lot of authoritarians do this of um, you, if you're if you have an external enemy and you can blame them for all sorts of stuff and uh, you know it doesn't hurt that you that they're ultimately saying uh, hey you know what's really going on it's a conspiracy my theory is that it's really the Jews you know uh, anything you're unhappy about you can just blame on them so there's something that is useful to them uh, politically in that regard uh, part of it is the other you know aspect of this is either change of government in Iran or a solution to the uh, Israel-Palestine question that uh, if there were somehow, and I do, I, I mean, I do not know how to do this. I'm not going to start saying, oh, two-state solution or whatever. But if the question were solved, if uh, Palestinians had rights or they had a state or whatever it is, it just this was no longer this uh, big problem that's been bedeviling the world for uh, decades, you know, decades upon decades. Now, um, if that were off the table, then they wouldn't be able to tap into it anymore. Um, so it is a sort of, you know, both sides in that regard uh, thing. It's a, you know, almost demand and supply issue that I think the government will supply. There's, of course, uh, elements of anti-Semitism that they both probably believe themselves, but also can tap into among the population that makes it easier. Uh, you can see this, say, in a number of other countries, but they're also pointing to real things that Israel is doing that bother a whole lot of people. And it's much easier to denounce somebody for things they're actually doing than denouncing things when you have to make up what they're doing, you know, right. or exaggerate or change it in some right. fashion. The other big dynamic is uh, the Iranian rival, uh, Iran's rival with uh, the Sunni Arab states, with especially Saudi Arabia, um, because that has pushed uh, Israel and the Arab countries more close to each other. And uh, this also speaks to that regional dynamic that I was talking about before, um, that a lot of it is, as much as people might put it on things like, I don't know, religion, uh, a lot of it just boils down to power um, in that the uh, high-level state power competitions, who is going to be the most powerful country uh, in the Middle East or which coalition, say, will be the most powerful. And uh, the United States and Iran have been on opposite sides of that for uh, we're a good, I don't know, 45 years running uh, at this point. And a lot of that is sort of locked in with U.S. also being partners with uh, not just Israel, but Saudi Arabia and the UAE and uh, Kuwait and Jordan and, you know, so other uh, Sunni Arab states. And that is the dynamic going forward. And that will mean that uh, the Iran will, you know, continue to, um, they'll also try to exploit things like if any of the Arab countries, the ones that are making deals with Israel, then it's, oh, the government is selling out the people and you should oppose them and you should be more friendly to us. And that is going to keep going for, yeah. I don't know, indefinite future. And the, there's a dynamic, right? The Shia are uh, the minority the, compared to the Sunni, yeah, right? Uh, globally, it's cl it's about 90-10. Um, yeah. The, so uh, when, in, when in doubt that the, yeah. so um, most of the Shia uh, are uh, Iran, Iraq, yeah. uh, Syria, yeah. And uh, Lebanon, Azerbaijan. That's most right. of the world's uh, Shia populations in there, and just about every other Muslim is some variation on or offshoot of or you know uh, version of. Syria. Yeah. So being the most anti-Israel, it's sort of a one could think it's sort of a way for the the Shia power to be like, well, we're the we're the real we're really the fighters of the faith kind of thing. Um, I can give you a, a specific example that just really quick, if you want a stat to back that up, uh, is the leader of Hezbollah, uh, Hassan Nasrallah, uh, sometimes has, on occasion has come in as the most popular uh, leader in, a poll, in polls of uh, Middle Eastern Arabs. Um, the way that they asked this, which I think is pretty clever, uh, I just I happen to know the pollster who does this, but uh, asked this where um, they say, uh, which leader besides your own do you most admire? So then, you know, these various countries that will not allow you to say negative things about the leader, they let you do that question. You know, so, uh, so it, it, for example, they pull Egypt and it lets, you know, instead of having to say, oh, well, of course, you know, uh, President Sisi, uh, then you get to say which other one. And a lot of this would be Arabs, Sunni Arabs, uh, who say that they admire Nasrallah. And the reason he's, you know, leader of Hezbollah, he's Shia. Uh, and the big reason why is just simply because because he stands up to Israel, because, you know, he uh, not only stands up to Israel, but stand, has stood up to them and lived to tell about it and kind of lived to continue it um, and presents himself as a leader of 
uh, all of the uh, all Muslims, all Arabs, all Persians, all Middle Easterners broadly, all people around the world who uh, would oppose Israel and maybe American imperialism or something in there too, uh, then you know stand with us. And yeah, people admire that that the um, things like uh, bonds of ethnicity, bonds of religion, that they only go so far. Um, a lot of times, you see with uh, ideology, and so even bringing it back to something we talked about earlier, I think one of the clearest ways you can see this is with American Jews that. The assumption that you know American Jews are going to stand with Israel no matter what because they're Jewish is just wildly false, and um, you know maybe some of them do and some of them don't. And uh, about I don't know about seventy some odd percent of American Jews uh, vote Democrat and almost certainly will continue to do so and prioritize American issues rather than say Israel issues. And the same thing goes for the Middle East with yeah maybe some uh, Shia are more inclined to work with Iran or more inclined to trust Iran. But ultimately, it's things like positions. If it's the if the Arab leaders are doing something you hate and the Persian leaders are doing something you like, well, then you you know approve of the leaders you like. How would you grade Netanyahu in what he's done in Gaza? Very poor. I, I don't know. So you know, slapping a um, the only reason I'm hesitant to say F is because it could be worse. Uh, I don't know D of the, and this is on Netanyahu specifically. And so uh, let me clarify, you know, what I mean by that at first, where, uh, I mean, from the, per, from a Israeli security and national strategy perspective. So meaning even, you don't need to take a, say pro-Palestinian stance to give this, you know, say really pro, uh, poor letter grade in that, uh, first off, a lot of October 7th is on him, um, in that, uh, he had pursued a strategy of, uh, keeping Hamas in power in Gaza because it kept the Palestinians divided and would, you know, work with them on occasion instead of still trying to keep them down or oppose them. But it was like they were good to have around to fight as opposed to then having to say, OK, well, I guess we have to do negotiations because, you know, the Palestinians are united behind, you know, maybe an idea that's more open to talking to us. Um, and with October 7th specifically, it was a lot of him and his government focused on getting their uh, judicial law that would sort of empower them uh, through and focusing on West Bank security. And then you mean the war itself? I just um, mean everything since October Okay, 7th. So, so everything yeah. since. I think a lot of October 7th is, is on him. Uh, and then uh, he has uh, overseen uh, conduct that at some level has to come from leadership. So I'm talking about uh, leadership decisions among uh, orders like uh, what are the rules of engagement, exactly how much prioritization should be put on avoiding civilian casualties of the case that he has been making uh, to the world about what Israel's doing is largely divorced from the specifics of the Gaza war that he seems to have no better idea than uh, to keep just basically make a Israel has a right to exist. The Holocaust was bad. Uh, there are people who attacked us. We need to defend ourselves. And uh, there are quite a few people who agree with everything that I just said there of uh, who would say, yes, of course, Israel has a right to exist and a right to exist as a Jewish state. Um, yes, of course, Israel has a right to defend itself. Of course, everybody, every state in the entire world would react with force in response to October 7th. Nobody could just leave, you know, a, a battalion that is going to attack them like that right across the border. Nobody could do that. And yet he didn't. And I'd include his speech to Congress this yesterday. He didn't really make the case of these specific actions are necessary, or um, I am uh, reject. I am going for this total victory rather than a ceasefire negotiation because, um, or a big concern for me is here is a workable plan for what's going to happen after, and here is the people within the Israeli government that I have tasked for doing all the administrative planning for what's going on after. Or let me give you just a uh, example of a specific microcosm of this that uh, where I say it was bad strategy. There was a big hospital that Israeli forces raided and um, because uh, Hamas had in part sit up there. And I think they had at least decent amount of evidence while well, they overstated how much Hamas was there. You know, they have evidence of things like rocket fire coming out of the hospital and uh, machine gun fire coming out of the hospital. You know, some militants are there under international law that makes a military target. And then they fight their way in and they get a lot of bad press uh, because of it, but they fight their way in and then they, uh, they have it. And then they leave. And then uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks later, Hamas comes back there and sets it up. Then the IDF goes back and they totally level the place. And uh, that was one that really stood out to me as someone who, for example, studies uh, asymmetric warfare and counterinsurgency warfare of a basic principle of counterinsurgency warfare 
uh, is clear hold build. As in, you know, you have to fight the insurgents to get them out of some place, but then you hang on to it and you build it up and uh, work with the local population on it. And so just as a really simple level of uh, even I heard somebody you know, making defense of, well, maybe Israel did a sort of bait and switch is, and, you know, we'll leave, they'll come back and then we'll get to fight them there. And as even if that's true, let's just give, let's totally give that, uh, you know, assumption and we don't know, but, you know, let's, let's just say that's totally true. You know what would be extremely useful for trying to govern Gaza afterwards? Having a physical hospital in that place. That that is something you can take over. Those are medical facilities you can use. Places need hospitals to just function. And the degree to which uh, Netanyahu has been, I'd say, not only uninterested, but actively hostile to the idea that this is something that is, this is not a problem that just ends. This goes on indefinitely, that Gaza is going to be under the best case scenario, Gaza is going to be a mess for years on end. And there is at absolute best, a relatively short window of opportunity to put it on a different path so that it doesn't end up just with Hamas reconstituting uh, at some point or another. And they don't see, and he doesn't seem interested in this at all, seems actively hostile to it, seems more concerned about his own political fate and uh, not unlike Trump staying out of jail because he's uh, faced corruption charges, which he almost certainly did. Um, and so has just done it really poorly. Uh, I think he he's done a great disservice, both I'd say uh, for Israel, for the world, um, you know, for the United States, uh, certainly, of course, for Palestinians. Um, and uh, it'd be really great if he would go. I wonder uh, if you agree with this. I think the Biden administration, I think their intentions were good, but the uh, months, and maybe it's not true, maybe it's just, Netanyahu just wanted to extend the war, but there was a lot of reporting that the Biden administration was trying to block Israel from taking the Rafah crossing for many months. You know, if I was president, I would have said the exact opposite. I would have said to Israel, don't touch the rest of Gaza. Just go take that crossing, cut those tunnels, you know, because destroying Hamas is a difficult sort of vague mission. Disarming Hamas, though. If they just, you know, cut off their weapon supply, that's like castrating Hamas, you know? You know, um, it's, a, it's a, yes, but uh, decently easier said than done. And the, uh, this is where you need to say the more complex strategy. So I think you're right in that there is a good military argument for uh, controlling the uh, Gaza-Egypt border and to uh, try to stop smuggling and a bunch of other stuff. Um However, uh, part of the problem is to Gaza is not self-sustaining. It needs food and construction materials and, you know, metal and other things. And those materials can be repurposed and stuff can be smuggled in with them. And there isn't really a way to totally cut off weaponry going into it. In fact, if anything, this has been proven by the last bunch of years because Gaza has been, Gaza has been under a pretty tight blockade and... Uh, they not only, you know, got a whole bunch of rockets and other stuff in there or but, took things like, I don't know, pipes and repurposed No, but they, the rockets, had a, they had a three-story tunnel they just found and to, there's, from uh, Egypt. And yeah. Tons of them. Yeah, oh, the, the tunnel network, you know, has been known and is extensive for a while, but that is, uh, you know, it's hard to find. There's always an arms race. So say Israel, uh, Israel would drop uh, charges on, this would be, you know, open space or open desert or something with the idea of destroying tunnels that are lower. And then Hamas next time would build the tunnel like another 50 feet down. And, um, you know, this sort of goes goes on and they can always find some ways to get around it. So a um, the idea that uh, Gaza could be somehow caught, uh, cut off from all weaponry, especially when weaponry against Israel has included things like, you know, kites on fire sent to fields. Not, um, not can't all. Can't really be done. Yeah, not or, all, but I think it could have been. I'm amazed they fought two wars in Gaza. And they never thought of, why don't we deal with these rockets coming in through the tunnels? That is well, they, they do. It's the, that's what I mean, for example, of the, uh, they put in a lot of seismic sensors to try to uh, detect tunnels and detect tunneling activity underground. Um, they've, as they try to destroy it, they try to uh, restrict the use of construction materials that um, maybe they could have done it better, uh, you know, or, or more thoroughly, but... Uh, overall, they have been trying more or less, and the best strategy that Israel landed on was one that they uh, nicknamed mowing the lawn, uh, meaning that 
they would only they wouldn't be able to they would restrict stuff coming in restrict for example weaponry uh but some would make it in and occasionally they would just need to go in and like blow up a bunch of rocket launchers and this is what the gaza wars looked like before this one uh before because hamas had never done something nearly as big as october 7th um but there were about four or five wars that were those sort of exchanges before but they didn't go they they went in and they would destroy some tunnels and mm-hmm. do but they didn't say what i would have done after october 7th is i would have said look we're just we're gonna be on that rafa crossing now and we're just gonna destroy all the tunnels and, and i would have not even touched any other part of gaza and i'll just be like well i'm sorry we're going to be checking everything going into Gaza now, and there's yeah, not going to um, be any more time. The, yeah. I don't think that's a strong enough reaction <laughs> in that the, uh, in particular, say, for the Israeli public, that the, the level of shock to their system and fear as a result of October 7th uh, was not something that could have been addressed. And also with, you know, the way that the national security establishment reacted and all of this that could not have been addressed with, we're going to step up some enforcement. That it doesn't mean they had to do it this way, but I, I do think a uh, Hamas cannot be in power in Gaza anymore was a near consensus, or that the the way I can tell you it happened in a lot of uh, in America and a lot in Europe, a lot of uh, say other security summit, including actually a number of Middle Eastern ones, also is uh, what October seventh did was up until that point they thought of Hamas as a uh, rational actor uh, in the sense of um, a bad actor. But that ultimately what Hamas was doing was statecraft, violent statecraft often, but still statecraft in the sense that uh, believed that they had the basic restrictions of a state, which was they liked being in charge of Gaza and wanted that to continue. And, you know, so wants to want to stay in power domestically. Um, And uh, what October 7th did was convince a lot of people. And this was something that Netanyahu tried to steer into, but couldn't. There's another good example of he couldn't actually grab onto what really was uh, global sympathy. But the idea that actually they're more like ISIS or, you know, that they would be, uh, it is so important to them to kill a bunch of Israelis that they would throw away everything else in order to be able to do it. And that means that you can't work with them. You can't deal with them. So as long as they were being like a, uh, like a state, a rogue state, a violent state, but still kind of like a state government, uh, you know, not a real state because they didn't control their own borders, but still that they were acting kind of state-like then there were people you can work with. You know, think of this in the sense of like, I don't know, North Korea, that it's pretty universal it's consensus stable, that they're equal, bad. It would be better if we no. could get rid of them, but it's more yeah. or less stable and we can kind of handle the situation. And that what October 7th communicated to a whole lot of these uh, governments and militaries and to the Israeli public was no, not really. And then in that case, it's they can no longer be allowed to be the dominant kind of governing and uh, security entity within Gaza. And once they decided to do that, then it was well past any sort of like, we're just going to hinder their ability while leaving them in power. Um, And I think that ultimately that is a, a, I I wrote this at the time and I I do even stand by it in the sense of, I think that that core logic is a, uh, makes sense in the, uh, way of this is really awful every option is bad and the option in which we in that case say from the israeli perspective we just simply allow people who did this to us to continue to be there and potentially do it again uh is off the table if that is by definition unacceptable therefore and then you get into some sort of larger war and so then the criticism and this is where i say even if you want to be generous to netanyahu and to israel uh, then the criticism is well, then you've handled it poorly and you've made a number of avoidable mistakes along the way. And that part, you know, I certainly agree with. Yeah, to end, I just want to sort of ask, there are actually, you know, there are some indications that since they've taken that Rafa crossing that the weapon supply, the rocket supply is running low for Hamas, that when the IDF is is capturing them, they're finding like 15-year-olds that they're Mm -hmm. now having to use like teenagers. Um, But obviously Israel has taken, to say the least, a huge PR hit on the international stage. Uh, Who who has won this ultimately? Uh, 
I mean, it's still not over, so I guess it depends how it ends. Um, I mean, at one level, part of the reason why I'm saying is nobody that, you know, even sometimes you can figure like who, you know, by extension, but I really, in this, and nobody in that, uh, maybe Hezbollah, the, they seem to sort of gain. So, uh, Israel certainly hasn't. Israel is in worse position than it was before October 7th, or for that matter, you know, uh, maybe shortly after. Hamas is certainly in worse position. I mean, you could say maybe if some of them were thinking of a uh, long-term goal of like making sure the next generation of Palestinians and their supporters really, really hate Israel, uh, I guess maybe that succeeded, but um, Hamas seemed to really think that they were sparking a regional war that was going to end, you know, that they were going to win, that was going to end to the downfall of Israel. Um, Iran has, uh, you know, sort of gained a little in PR, but they also uh, showed that their uh, air capabilities against Israel are less than they and others thought, and they've lost at least some of their Hamas asset that was in Gaza. Uh, the United States seems worse off. I don't even think it's a, uh, without all these people, you know, getting knocked down, that somebody else is kind of just rising by still standing or I is mean, able to pick up the pieces or anything. I, I really I, don't have a good answer. I, I, think, I think anybody's benefited from it. You know, Iran, they still have all their territory. They've uh, made northern Israel into a ghost town. So I'd say they definitely have won vis-a-vis -vis Israel. You know, I wonder, because me and you have sort of the same opinion about what Israel should be doing. And I wonder how closely you follow Israeli politics, because it's not good <laughs> as far as it is just the, 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 there is, the left is so crippled in that country and it's just moving in the the most absolutist direction and the Bangvir is doing this horrible stuff on Temple Mount. How depressed are you? Do you think the sanctioning these settlers maybe is is there any way that we can stop Israel from moving further into this far right? Uh well, you know, um I was about to give say uh it, uh, an almost blanket, like, no, I don't think so. Or like, how long have you been frustrated by it? So I, I, I follow it, I'd say pretty darn closely. And, or at least, you know, as much as say, uh, someone who's not Israeli does. Do you uh, speak and, Hebrew? Mm, no. Okay. So, yeah. uh, right, I don't know in terms of maybe the the rhetoric, the, what rhetoric, how does it differ from English versus uh, speaking in Hebrew that I couldn't really tell you. Um, the, in terms of just long-term situation, I mean, I think they have been largely screwed for a while and that the, uh, the looking at the broader Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it has looked, you know, static and in a, the sense of the stasis is a gradually worsening one and, uh, one that seems like it was defying solutions in all sorts of ways. Uh, the, in terms of Israeli domestic politics, uh, I think it is possible that, um, you know, I would say not even possible. Uh, we don't really know what it's going to look like after the war. And uh, it's something that we can't really get a good sense of a good measurement now, that people in the midst of an ongoing armed conflict just tend to think differently than they do that once it's over. Um, that if this ends with something like Israel saying, you know, oh, like total victory and making it, and that's vaguely plausible, or if it ends with some sort of uh, deal that is brokered by a number of powerful countries and they show real commitment to it, or at the other end of the spectrum, if this ends in a way where it just kind of fizzles without resolving anything and looks like this uh, I don't know, just festering situation for the indefinite future and where the Israeli government doesn't have a handle on it. And so there are all sorts of possibilities uh, in that way. Um, in the same sense that the, what alternatives, you know, would come up and um, with Netanyahu, he is able to uh, put off elections legally as long as his coalition holds together until 2026. So um, the, there's, you know, enough time for a number of different things to happen in all sorts of, you know, different ways of the October 7th was less than a year ago. And so if somebody said, how are Netanyahu's political chances, they wouldn't be talking, they'd be talking about the Palestinians very little. And now they're talking about them a lot, you know, in that sense. So um, things will happen from that. I think there is a, a strong negative reaction to Netanyahu specifically uh, because of this has been largely papered over a lot, uh, at least as far as, say, the rest of the world sees it with October 7th. 
but where he had staked his, uh, so much of his political reputation was on, I keep Israelis safe. And then he was the prime minister during the worst attack on Israel ever. And one that was, when you analyze it closely, avoidable in numerous ways that have screw ups that trace back to leadership. And Israeli critics have been still, you know, hurling this at him. And at least if we look at Israeli polls, uh, Bibi himself would probably be in a lot of trouble if they actually held elections, which is also why he's, you know, not holding elections and holding off. Uh, so I don't know. I, I don't want to. I don't want to write it off. Uh, but I'd say, from you know my perspective, especially Israel had Israeli domestic politics had been trending in a bad direction for a while, uh, getting progressively worse. That um, Netanyahu's latest coalition, in which he uh, he brought the you know the far right into government. I'd say in particular. Uh, the people, it's the descendants of the parties that had been uh, banned for supporting terrorism, you know, literally uh, ones supporting terrorism, of uh, ones that, you know, calls itself the translation is the Jewish Power Party. And if Americans think of that as like the white power party, you got a pretty good sense of what they're about. Um, and no, they are, um, I've been very negative about that group of people for a long amount of time about their politics. And they have been more ascendant in Israel domestically than not. So the issue will just be that potentially October 7th in the war really shakes up uh, Israeli politics once it settles. But I don't know if that's the case and it could easily continue. Or uh, perhaps if the reaction to it instead is more negative or uh, if, um, you know, when you talked about, say, Biden managing it, of one example that I think a lot of Americans underestimate is that, well, I don't think this is likely, but in the hypothetical uh, possibility that the United States starts treating Israel as a pariah as opposed to a partner. You know, you're cut off and, you know, giving speeches about how terrible they are and, um, you know, supporting a lot of, I don't know, international legal action against them and all that other stuff. If the United States do that, there are Israel critics who uh, are just assuming that the reaction of uh, Israelis will be, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, just we'll, we'll change. How do you want us to change? As opposed to uh, the reaction, which I think is more likely, is them getting both uh, more nervous and more self-righteous and uh, lashing out more in a, a combination of both uh, greater fear and more of a, well, there's no one, you know, we're the only ones that we have, we're the only ones that will care about ourselves, you know, it's up to us. Uh, the, you know, uh, the, the non-Jews of the world, you know, have tried to kill us before. And so, of course, they're turning on us again. And that this logic will, uh, if anything, push them more in the direction rather than less. And, yeah. Uh, so that's a live possibility. If you listen to the like Israeli far right, the scariest thing about them is the, the level of delusion. They really like, uh, if you look at figure like Moshe Faglin, I don't know if you know him. Mm -hmm. But he just said, you know, turn Gaza into Dresden. You know, there shouldn't be anybody left. Just move them all out into Egypt and this kind of talk. And it's uh, it's very alarming that they think that they would ever get away with that. Uh, you know, it's just amazing. I finally read uh, Smotrich, who's in the Netanyahu, his big document, uh, The Decisive Plan. Have you read that? Uh, I've not read it, but I'm very familiar with him and it, have had a long running, very negative opinion. Well, yeah, what's shocking about it is very long. And basically the idea is his vision is uh, we're going to take over the West Bank and we're going to offer them. Um, he, he says in it, if they don't give up their national aspirations, we'll send them to some other Arab country. And I was amazed to find looking at it, I just word search countries. He doesn't even mention what country would go along with this. And none it's of them amazing. want them. Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah. And, and none of them would. So this is one where uh, I think one of the reasons why, you know, I and I'm sure many others, you know, have a sympathy for the Palestinians is they're, they've just been screwed from every angle. Uh, that it's everybody. And I, a lot of people who talk about, you know, tend to just like pick out one uh, people. And of course, you know, say Israel more than others, but just one to really hate. And the answer is it is a giant group effort. I um, mean, you know, just give an example of this, of the uh, the blockade of Gaza is a Israel-Egypt blockade. It does not work if it is not a blockade, if Israel, Egypt was not doing it. Um, the uh, reason why Gazan, say, refugees are not allowed to go into other countries is in part because people like Egypt are saying, we do not want them in. We are keeping this border closed. They are not allowed in here. Um, and that goes for a number of other countries, too. But this is also fairly normal country behavior that, uh, I don't know, you think of 
trying to think like there's there really is not a good analogy with the United States. But it would be something like if I don't know the Mexican government was like, hey, there are these 15 million uh, people in Mexico that we kind of don't really want around, and so our solution is they should all just move to the United States. You can imagine how Americans would. We talked about immigration right at the start and the border and stuff, and Americans' reaction would be like, you can't just dump 15 million people on us. Like that is not how anything works. What? And so none of those countries want it. And so when you have somebody uh, like, you know, say some of these Israeli far right officials, what they are doing first off is, you know, open that case, I would say that is a open call for ethnic cleansing. That uh, where, you know, people, you can quibble about other terminology, but the, uh, you know, where we can so get into the, this one I think is sort of inarguable of they're saying here, there's this ethnicity, there are these people on this land, we want that land, so we want them gone. We are going to clear them out one way or another. And here he's saying, like, well, we'll give them voluntary options to leave, but if not, we'll make them. Well, and then what? And so when he says, like, where will they go? Well, they don't really have an answer for that. That's why he hand waves with, you know, oh, other countries, as in, like, it'll become other people's problem, and it can't. And so I don't know how much of this, uh, some of it, I really do think he really believes in. I don't think it's like, you know, just playing a character, uh, but he is also playing to a particular constituency within Israel that is really into it. Yeah, that, I mean- uh, uh, You know, this is what they want. Smotrich in his plan, it's, it, I, he doesn't really explain how it will be determined, but he, his, basically he says, no, they can stay if the individual uh, Palestinian says, okay, I renounce my national aspirations. I'm not sure how he would go about, you know, no, verifying that. It, and this is, but, of course, what he won't. Yeah. But if it was a, if it were something like, I announce, I, I will renounce my national aspirations and become a full and equal citizen of Israel. Well, that is one solution. That is one possibility. Everybody that the Israeli state controls would get a vote in the Israeli government. But of course, that's not what, uh, what he wants. Yeah, no, and they just and there's one English language podcast I'd recommend to you because it gives insight into what it's called. Two nice Jewish boys. They actually aren't uh -huh. that nice anymore <laughs> since okay. October seventh. But mm -hmm. it's really scary the amount they really like say. Well, we'll just bribe uh, Uganda to take a bunch of. And it's like it, it is. It's scary that they they think that they they. Or get away with that, or making an argument that there is a Palestinian state. It's Jordan. Yep. And yeah, it's, I, it's like you're not going to be able to sell this stuff. You know, it's, it's because like, they are not. Uh, the most charitable way I can describe that is they are not doing policy planning. That uh, this is not. They're doing something that amounts to, I don't know. That's like closer to arguing with somebody on the internet. You know, the idea of uh, any time when they run into what is a very fundamental problem with their plan, because they're not willing to actually look at, actually confront the origins of it and sort of the basis of the problem. Um, so then they just, you just hand wave it away. You know, so the, um, it, it's almost like a, a version of, reminds me of the, the old joke about uh, an economist. So as an economist and an engineer and a physicist are stuck down a well. And the engineer and the physicist keep on trying to figure out ways to like make notches in the walls or get a message up or get a rope or anything like that. And the economist is sitting there calmly and they get really frustrated. Like, why? Why? What's what's your plan? And the economist goes, assume there's a letter. You know, and it's, I don't know, a joke right about uh, economic modeling and non-human behavior, but that's more or less what they're doing of the um, so is where, oh, uh, we want the land some of these Palestinians are on. So assume they go somewhere else. Well, yes, if you just assume that they go somewhere else, then you've solved the problem, but they're not going anywhere else. And, uh, you know, so that is what is the core situation. And, um, yeah, it's just like an excuse to not think about it as opposed to a actual plan. It's not like as a member of government, he has put in uh, a lot of effort into reaching out to the Ugandan government and trying to work out. Even and I mean, I think this would be, uh, you know, a bad idea and immoral in the first place. But even uh, if you were to do it, it would be like, well, hey, could we buy a big enclave in Uganda? Do you have any land for sale in Uganda? What are the rights in Uganda for other people? Will you do special minority protections for these people? Like they're not doing any of that. So it's not like they're even trying to do their crazy plan in the first place. They just say that as a way to avoid actually talking about it. I was at a Jewish Voice for Peace hosted book talk by uh, Ben Lorber in Chicago at a bookstore recently and I, I really like ben lorber um anyways but i was in the milieu a very pro progressive chicago jewish uh 
people at this talk. And it was interesting. They talked about Israel. Uh, they're like, what? It was like, it's going to be gone soon, like in 20 years. Like they really believe that. Like they're already talking about, well, we need to prepare Judaism for when, once Zionism is gone in 20 years. Do you think that's crazy? I also think that one's very unlikely in the same sense when we talked about a bunch of the Iran things in that the the situation still looks static to me, that the there are uh, enough people in Israel who are strongly in favor of uh, keeping the state and keeping it uh, definitionally Jewish, and they have a fairly strong army, and they have nuclear weapons, and uh, they are in a broader regional coalition that with, you know, say increasingly Arab countries, but especially with the United States and against Iran that, um, and given that uh, Russia is increasingly closer with Iran, we're really getting up to global dynamic power dynamics here. And so all of that make it that, I mean, if you ask me to predict what's gonna happen, I'd say it's just gonna keep on stumbling forward in this uh, perpetual thing where uh, there are people who passionately want something, Way too many of them passionately want something that's absolutist, but enough of them do that they can both uh, prevent losing it while also not gaining it and kind of making the situation worse and worse. So um, I start this even with, you know, just on a personal note with a lot of, say, the broader Zionist question of I don't really care is the wrong word, but like I because I the question of something like does Israel right to have it have a right to exist or should there be a Jewish state? It's just not a question I'm all that interested in talking about because uh, I don't think there's any value in that should. And just for the simple reason of that, there is. And uh, the power is the material power and the power dynamics are such that there will be and that they can hold it. And therefore, how do we make, I don't know, how do we deal with that? How do we manage that? You know, I take it almost as a, a fact of, actually, I'll give you a similar one of anybody who's like, well, um, how do we get rid of Iran? Or we're like, how do we make it that, you know, Iran is a secular American friendly democracy? And uh, my take on that is just, you can't. So let's deal with the world as it is. I will leave it there. You've been so generous with your time. Thank you for talking and thank you for, you know, so many people are partisans and extreme and, and, and there's so few people who sort of try to just see things clearly. Um, and that's you are one of those people. So thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And yeah, uh, this was a you know, a good conversation.